Yeah, so it's, a, it's been an honor here to be here in the Airflow community and present about the Uber's journey with Airflow and its evolution internally. I mean, we are not a major contributor to Airflow, but we like seeing all the amazing presentations and what's coming in Airflow. We want to be a part of it and converge back to it. So I'm, a, uh, I'm Shobit Shah. I'm the staff so software engineer at Uber and I'm leading the data workflow platform team. And I have here Sumit with me, who is a well-known PMC uh, and also a tech lead at Uber. So yeah, the agenda for today is uh, like, basically we will be walking through how the data workflow management space looks at Uber, how it evolved at different stages and uh, with the reasoning, like why did we go from this architecture to this architecture and uh, in the end, we will do a comparison between the features that we have today that are coming in Airflow and some of the features that we are lagging behind. And what is the plan ahead? Like uh, we started with Airflow, we are at different points. So how do we see the future? So this is what the talk is going to be. There are some interesting things for the uh, users to uh, uh, catch from this slides. Like uh, we have some internal techniques that where you can do the authoring based on UI. So I hope it, there are some learning uh, for everyone here. So before we get started, uh, I just want to highlight on the scale at which the Uber operates. So how many of you here have not taken an Uber ride? Okay, <laughs> we have. Yeah, so apart from one or two people here, I think everyone is a part of the statistics here. So Uber operates in uh, six continents, uh, 70 countries, 10,000 plus cities and does a 30 million trip a day. Uh, yeah, like there's some other numbers as well, but uh, let's go ahead with this. So what are the key uh, use cases for the data platform at Uber? So first and foremost is like generating the reports of uh, profit and loss and quarterly reporting. So basically we do all the telling about how many trips were there, uh, accounting of those trips and uh, reporting the data to government as well. So a lot of times at the airport, uh, you might have seen that uh, Uber picks you up. There's a pickup fee involved with the acquisition every airport. Sometimes the drivers don't pay any fees because uh, Uber internally detects that this driver was in the airport and then uh, we will pay them uh, in bulk together to the government. So even if we kind of miss uh, some of the trips that went to airport but we didn't report to government, we incur huge penalties uh, from this uh, governments and uh, organizations. So. Those are some of the other use cases. Uh, some of the main other use cases are like about the analytics, uh, fraud detection. So every time when a driver is trying to ride an Uber and go on the trips, they have to do that face verification. So even those verifications, uh, they need to happen continuously at a different uh, frequency and we need to detect uh, frauds as well. Like how, what is the statistics? What is the growth rate uh, at which Uber is increasing, forecasting the needs if you want to scale up and all those things. Yeah, so uh, for the evolution of the airflow, uh, we will be talking about what is the current landscape at Uber around 2016. So uh, up, up, till, up until a uh, few years before, each and every team were doing their own thing in silos. Like some teams used Apache Airflow, some used uh, Apache Uzi, uh, Jenkins, Cadence, all their own custom built solutions. So this created a lot of problem, like with anyone new who wanted to onboard to data and do moving of data, they need to see like, do not need to set up the system completely by themselves, uh, which of the, them, which of the systems they can leverage uh, based on the needs they have. So from this landscape, it's very obvious to know what are the gaps in the system. Like there's no standardization, there's no centralized support because each team is working in their own silos. Teams end up uh, provisioning the resources at a, their own needs and most of the times we see that uh, they are they're like unutilized resources lying with some teams but other teams are not getting the resources. Teams, if they are working in silos, they will never upgrade. Like unless you have a strong reason or justification like you need to go to a new Python version because the old Python, Python has reached end of life. I mean, my pipeline is working fine. Why will I upgrade? Like there is no need for that unless someone is pushing me centrally. So this was a big uh, compliance issue and the security issue and yeah, so because of all these uh, gaps and opportunities, uh, we kind of did an evaluation and uh, thought that Airflow is like the best suited uh, solution out there in the market that time. And it also has the best flexibility to uh, for a broad range of users. 
from data scientists to developers and uh, business analysts. So we decided that we will uh, double down on Airflow and start providing the services as a centralized service. We didn't wanted to get into the business of creating different Airflow clusters for each customer of Uber, but we wanted to have a single instance. So the migrations and all those things are also kind of easy. So the V1 of Airflow at Uber, like we call it internally as Piper. So this is when the bootstrapping happened and it ha we set up the mono repo for pipelines and the whole uh, DSL was from Airflow. So here, like the process is like uh, fairly simple. Like a user basically, like I think many of the teams or organizations are doing the same practices. So a user uh, writes a DAG and commits to the mono repo. There's a build job that continuously runs and uploads it to cloud storage. And then this zip files are downloaded by all the services and available to the, uh, at the time of the execution. And the architecture is also, I think we have seen in multiple uh, presentations earlier from other teams, there is like Python workflows, uh, which is executed on work, uh, workers. Even the scheduler is kind of using the Python workflows before scheduling. And the, all the information is stored in the meta database about all the runs and all those things. So I think we forked from Airflow 1.7 around that time. And the whole stack was uh, used on the Uber's infrastructure. So some of the obvious gaps, uh, like we all are aware about uh, from the older versions of Airflow was about the scalability and performance. So since we were kind of doing the Python uh, file processing at the scheduler level, there were a lot of uh, scheduling issues, like uh, the pipelines were, like there was huge delay as and when the scale increased, there was a huge delay in when the pipelines actually got scheduled uh, from the time they were supposed to get executed. And some of the uh, issues that we faced were about uh, integration. So integration was not a problem from Airflow as such. Uh, around this time at Uber, like there was a big adaptation and uh, push to move to uh, Java and Go. So this is the point which I consider is like the diverging point where if we wanted to do anything new, we had to go with the Go and Java services. We cannot use the Python services that time. So I think this led to the divergence of how uh, Uber and Piper went in, uh, like, sorry, Piper and Airflow went into two different directions. Otherwise, we would have been like happy committers to uh, Airflow as well. So, yeah, like, so this is the first thing that uh, we did here for scaling is we separated out the uh, serializers separately, which I think is popularly known as DAC processor in Airflow. So, these things at Uber work in a high availability mode. So we have a zookeeper where uh, one of the, uh, which is used for later reaction and one of the serializer is kind of master and the other one is like a secondary backup uh, standalone serializer. Uh, so what it does, does is basically extract, goes through all the Python files and DAGs written by the user and uh, it will put the metadata information in the metadata database and uh, schedulers don't need to look at the Python files at the time of scheduling. So I think, uh, Airflow had this feature in uh, 2.0 and uh, yeah, it's available in Airflow as well, but yeah, we did something like that. And the other main changes were in the scheduler. So uh, we split the scheduler in uh, three different parts. One is orchestrator, uh, scheduler and prioritizer. So all these services were rewritten in Java. So the role of the orchestrator is also like, basically it will see what are the pipelines that needs to be scheduled. It will do a select all query, the pipelines that are active and then it will distribute those pipelines to schedulers. So schedulers here at Uber like are kind of horizontally scalable. We had about 20 instances of scheduler running at some point of time. So the way it works is like basically each scheduler will come up and register on Zookeeper and say that, hey, I am present. Uh, and then orchestrator will see like who all other schedulers that are present and distribute the pipelines uh, evenly among them. So I think uh, Airflow has a different route where it is using the DB level locking of uh, rows and it also does the sharding based on the similar fashion, but uh, we use the traditional approach of uh, scaling. And then we have a prior, so basically a scheduler is responsible for creating the runs based on the dependencies, if the upstream and downstream tasks are met or not, and it will create a task instance runs. And then the prioritizer is the service that will basically check if the salary workers are having any capacity left in them uh, what is the pool usage and then it will put in the Redis queue. And then like the rest of the architecture is similar only. So uh, here the architecture was uh, able to scale fairly good enough for the scheduling up till some time. 
so we started hitting yeah like i mentioned all these points read in java zookeep a little action yeah and so along with this we had two new features about uh, jumpstart and ui based authoring experience so sumit will be covering in more detail about this so yeah like the architecture was uh, fairly scalable and we were able to schedule a lot of pipelines and dags at the same time but we did encounter some problems like uh, noisy neighbors so basically a uh, low tier pipeline uh, was running on the same uh, executor salary executor uh, and on the salary executors we had about eight workers running in parallel so there can be a low tier task that is running with a high tier task and uh, sometimes let's say if the low tier pipelines are not written very well they will do a whole data frame loading that will consume all the memory and the high tier pipelines are suffering because of that uh, on the performance side so basically the serializer the dag processor that we are so, uh, talking about so it is running in a tight loop scanning all the python files and then extracting the information but uh, this the scale at uber increased very rapidly we have about 45000 python files in the mono repo and let's say if one of the driver is like taking long time to produce pipelines so all the other pipelines are all the other python files are not processed because of that so this led into like longer times like about 1 to 2 hours for the new pipeline should be det detected by the system and the disaster recovery so this was a top down non negotiable ask for the whole data platform at uber so we have we have to have the failover support for in between two different regions uh, this is mainly because the uber was on the on prem stack and yeah so let's see how we evolved on this uh, with multi executor multi serializers and multi region architecture so yeah just stay with me it like it can it's like very similar to what we have so let's address the uh, problems about the uh, noisy neighbor problem so we had a, a high tier work, salary workers where high tier pipelines get scheduled and they will go into those salary workers so this is done by separating out the redis queue that uh, the salary workers are using and the low tier pipelines or dags can go to old salary workers now we also have the ability here to partition the uh, high tier workers based on different teams so let's say if some maps team is coming and telling that we need a dedicated uh, cluster for running the salary jobs so they will just go on to that uh, high tier salary on the different partition so this this is not really solving the noisy neighbor problem because we are still having a parallel task and one task can starve the other task i think the kts will be like the ideal solution that we plan to move uh, soon uh, second problem about the uh, serializer like when the processing is very slow what we did is like we did the same thing that we did on the scheduler we split the serializer and partitioned it so one of the like there are multiple serializers you can scale it dynamically and they come and register that this these are the present serializers and yeah each of the serializer is like given a uh, different set of folders by one of the leader so let's say we have like 100 folders on the top level so each of and we have 10 serializers so each of the serializer will get like 10 folders to look into and they will be processing those files and uh, for this slow processing like whenever we find out that a uh, particular python file is like uh, taking longer time for serializing because it's connecting to some db or reading some yaml files and then producing the pipelines so what we do is like we have a config based uh, approach where we kind of put those pipelines uh, driver path in a different serializer so all the slow files that take longer than 2 minutes let's say will be processed by a single uh, serializer so the other files are not processed the other files get processed very quickly and we have about like in within 10 minutes a new pipeline gets discovered so yeah so that is that is about the second problem that faced and here we see like primary and secondary which are like two different regions like one is on the east coast one is on the west coast of us so the way we have disaster recovery is like the whole piper uh, works in active active mode so a uh, same pipeline can run in uh, both the zone both the regions uh, separately create a different runs produce the data in both the di different data sets so initially we had this approach where there were like dual executions happening and this was kind of resulting in a huge compute cost so we had another team which is like hive sync that came in and they said you don't need to run the compute on secondary region you just uh, run the compute on primary region and we will copy the data that is produced to the secondary region so they basically sync the data that is produced in the primary region to secondary region and in case of a failover when the zone 1 goes down 
those pipelines will turn on in secondary region and they will continue producing the data on top of what earlier data was produced. So here, basically we need to know like if there's single pipeline running in both the environments and we need to continue from some point, there is no sync in database. Uh, we don't have the information about how many runs have happened in the uh, primary region and till what point the pipelines have caught up. So what, what we have added is like a multi-region database. So here we basically say what is the state of the pipeline, whether it's paused in primary region or not. And up till, like after every run, the state will be updated like uh, the pipeline has completed the runs up till, up till this checkpoint. So this kind of information is uh, saved in the multi-region. And let's say if the primary region completely, completely goes down, the secondary region will come up, it will check, okay, this pipeline is unpaused in this region, I can continue from this checkpoint. And then it will continue running on the secondary region. And once the primary region comes back up, we will do a reverse hive sync of the data that is produced in the secondary region during the failover. And the things can continue back in primary. So one call out here is like, we don't have the compute capacity exactly as primary. We only have about uh, 20 to 30 percent of capacity reserved for tier one, tier two workloads. And rest of the capacity in case if a failover happens will be done like using the cloud bursting. Yeah, uh, this was about the DR support and the uh, architecture. So, like things were better here uh, till this point of time, uh, till Uber decides that we need to move to cloud instead of on-prem. So, now we have to support uh, moving to cloud infrastructure. We didn't decide to go with any managed uh, service providers like maybe Google Cloud Composer or uh, Amazon or Astronomer because we have built all this uh, tech stack that, that was like far scalable and we uh, like this is like Uber's way of doing like it will create a wrapper on top of whatever is the underlying technology and to the end user it's like not visible uh, like let's say if I want to create a database I will just go on a portal and say I want a SQL based database underlying technology can be MySQL or anything. So it just gives up an option for three to four op selections, like if it's a time series database or based on the use case, it will create those things. So we want to extract out the information and uh, that's why we kind of have our own stack on top of the bare metals in, uh, on the cloud. So to adopt to the cloud, uh, basically we, uh, the way how we are supporting this cloud migration is, uh, we have a workload, uh, so a workload can run in either on-prem or cloud based on the Redis queue that uh, it is sent to. So we have a tracking of each uh, DAG, whether it runs on-prem on or on cloud. And based on that DAG, the appropriate queue will be used and then the executors, salary, the, the ones on the uh, orange color are kind of executing on-prem and connecting to HDFS stack. And uh, the ones in greens are like going on GCS uh, and executing on the cloud and storing the data in uh, GCS buckets. So on, on the uh, orchestration side, it's fairly easy. Like we just have to put the queue and it will work. But there were some other challenges that we faced. Like when we decide that we want to migrate this particular DAG to cloud, and if it, it is running at that time, uh, we cannot just migrate because there can be some tasks that are still in the pending state or they are not scheduled yet. So there will be half run complete and the half run will happen on cloud and we don't want that. So we introduced some new features like draining where once we decide that this pipeline needs to be migrated, the current run of the pipeline will complete and the next run will kind of uh, pause. And after that time, we will do the migration. And there are like a lot of other nuances about the data as well. Let's say my uh, pipeline is producing some data in cloud and there are some dependent pipelines that are on-prem which needs to access that data. So we do have a hive sync copying data from cloud to HDFS or let's say otherwise. But let's say when my pipeline is running in cloud and it's accessing on-prem data, but the latest data of on-prem is not available on cloud. So what do we do? So here we kind of introduced uh, freshness based scheduling. So the way it works is like we have a lineage about which DAG is accessing which uh, set of data and what partitions are being accessed. So at the time of running, I will check whether the data set available on, uh, on cloud, is it fresh or not? So basically, a uh, hive sync team guarantees the SLA of four hours. So if the data set is like not, uh, not copied within, like it will also have a lag that if my pipeline is running on some data set and that data set is not updated uh, on cloud, it will just wait and get rescheduled after some time. So once the data set lag catches, cap, uh, falls in the acceptable time zone, 
time period, uh, the DAG will continue to run uh, on cloud. So yeah, these are some of the additional features we had to build for the cloud hybrid architecture. Uh, now I, I will invite Sumit to talk about the ecosystem and some advanced features that we have built. Yeah. Yeah, thanks Shobit uh, for giving a eight years ride into 22 minutes. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was uh, I think quite overwhelming. Uh, so just to keep it light, I won't go too much technical and uh, yeah, just for fun fact, how many notice that uh, our t-shirts are matching the theme of the Uber, right? So, <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so over the time, actually, it's not only about the scale, like, you know, Uber has, uh, you know, invested a lot into, uh, you know, the ecosystem around Piper as well. Uh, and a lot of the things you would find similarities uh, between in Airflow 2 or Airflow 3 things, which are already like available or close to available at Uber. So um, this is one of the thing like you work which is uh, like I know the Airflow community has not been very positive about it, like creating a you know UI based authoring tool. But around 2020, there was a need uh, felt. I don't know, maybe like about the downsizing, maybe the reason. But yeah, so there was a need to you know that we should have a way to create uh, you know these pipelines or decks uh, faster. We should be able to iterate them faster, right? There should not be a commit, some review, and then it will go into uh, into the Piper cluster in 30 minutes or something like that, right? So. Um, this this tool was got born actually it is worked onto a uh, you know predefined format uh, you know templates or uh, you can call it JSON templates where you drag and drop uh, task and then it will create uh, the deck out of out of the box basically it also has lot of uh, you know ETL what do you call it ETL processes underneath uh, predefined basically so if you say hey I want to load say Hive data to Kafka. So there might be like five steps involved into it, right? But you don't have to worry about it. You just have to drag and drop a single task. You just provide your Hive data set and the Kafka, you know, that server and address and whatever, right? And then it will do everything underneath uh, without worrying about it. Um, it also has some, uh, you know, other supports because it's a JSON driven, right? So you can do easy things like, you know, do import export, uh, you know, commit into, uh, you know, your code repository. Um, those things are also available. One extra thing it available, which was not, available in the code one, which is the versioning. So because we are actually changing uh, things from the UI, we could actually version those JSON. And then if somebody want to revert back to previous version, that is possible. Actually, that is possible in the code as well. But you have to kind of do a git, uh, you know, git revert basically, right? But it's easier. And also you can do schedule, you know, the backfills and those things from the UI, um, you know, unlike going into any CLI thing. And last point, it's a multi-engine. It's uh, built for batch ETLs and the real-time engines as well. But Piper, you know, has been the, the major driving force and like and kind of consuming the 90% or like contributing to 90% of the workloads um, overall. How do we achieve it, right? Um, so that is done via this something called Managed Pipeline API, where we have fixed contract in a JSON where you can define, uh, you know, what are the tasks, what are the dependencies, and boom, right, you will get a deck created automatically. That is the basically, uh, the, you know, the driving force for the UAC. And uh, as of now, 50% of the pipeline are actually managed pipelines. And when I say 50%, that's a huge number because I will come into the final number at the later slides, right? Similarly, for backfills, we have took a different approach from Airflow because uh, in Airflow, it required Airflow CLI to be installed. It required the whole dependencies, connection to the database and like everything required, right? Like Otherwise, you're not able to run the backfill, you know, uh, CLI. And yet also, uh, yeah, so how does it work in uh, in Uber is that you actually make an API call. It would actually store the relevant information, like what is the start time, what is the end time, what is the parent pipeline, and uh, that's it, right? It gets stored into JSON format. And then we have uh, these driver files written here, actually. So these drivers are actually uh, as a part of the serializer, which Shobhi showed earlier. Actually, these uh, this, this are like bit heavy py uh, Python files, which actually process all the data and generate the managed pipelines or the backfill pipelines and uh, some other type of driver pipelines we also have. And yeah, the other, other part we are not, uh, you know, I think draw here, but uh, like workers and those things also have the access to these files and they will be able to process the dig in, yeah, at the runtime basically. Uh, yeah, this is one of my favorite, you know, uh, topic as well, the jump start, basically, the data aware scheduling. Um, so if you think it's like very similar to uh, the data sets uh, in Airflow 2, 
right, where you can, you, you have some data set incoming, right, data set changes and on the basis of that you are triggering the tags. But here what we have is that we do not have it part of the Piper itself. What we have is that we have the syntax, like a YAML based syntax, and uh, it actually queries external uh, data catalog system. So those events are not meant to come to uh, the Piper, right? We actually kind of, you know, pull those events so that it is like external, right? So any service like say, you know, uh, Spark or a Hive writing something, some data sets, and uh, we are able to query those data set changes from, you know, our service, from our infrastructure basically, and able to trigger those decks. So this supports syntax like, you know, the freshness one and the completion one, and also like some basic syntax like about whether it's running or not and all those things, right? So what do you mean by freshness? Whether the data is, you know, fresh and enough, like what is the, you know, like it's a 30 minute already been done or like you can do define those things or the complete, uh, completeness as well, right? Uh, like uh, when was the data was completed last or like when what it was lastly seen and things like that. Uh, yeah, so it, it definitely enhances the scheduling flexibility, of course. And uh, we are actually looking for Airflow 3 uh, external data set feature because I think that that might can be a replacement of our customization here. The next part is about the workflow governance. Uh, what does it mean by governance? When you are actually running, you know, thousands pipeline, a governance is uh, very much required because you do not want uh, that, you know, some of the pipelines are just eating up, uh, you know, resources. So it has actually lots of rules and, yeah, it has a lot of rules and, you know, policies. So the major one is about identifying the pipelines of which tier, either they are tier one or two or they are tier three, four, five, right? And how do we do it? We do it via the which data sets this pipeline are touching to, right? Which data set this pipeline are writing to. On the, on the basis of those data sets, we identify that this tier, these pipelines are actually tier one or tier two, so that it actually useful for many use cases. For example, when you want to give a like dedicated resources for the tier one and two pipelines, or, or we want to like do the disaster recovery, and then which pipeline we would like to run only in the case of uh, failing out to the secondary pipe, secondary data center. Mm. Yeah. Uh, other things like, you know, it has the alerting policies automatically built in. So the tier one, tier two pipelines would have the pager duty and the, uh, you know, email alerts uh, out of the box. You have to do it. Uh, sorry, it will be get added to uh, those things. It also has the cost efficiency. So it will actually, you know, clean up the inactive, policy, in inactive pipelines from the system or, uh, you know, it will also mandate people to, you know, set up the expiry date of their pipelines. You know, there are various ways to do it, but yeah, if you do not do it, it will be marked as expired. You'll get email, of course, and then it will be get removed from the system if you don't do it uh, over the time. Yeah, this is another, you know, one of the, another driver for the pipeline growth at Uber, like it's a config-driven pipeline, config-driven pipeline setup, where people do not need to know anything about the Piper or Python or Airflow, right? They can just say, uh, you know, what is uh, my data set, right, the source and destination, and, uh, and what is my engine, like this is Spark or Presto or uh, there are some more engines actually internally with the internal names, doesn't make any, like doesn't gonna ring any bell. Uh, but yeah, so what it's gonna do is that it will need to convert, it will gonna take your config, it has a fixed directory structure first thing, right? It has to be like a, you know, there's a detail statement, like the creative statement basically, and there's a convert, if you want to convert, uh, you know, from some a SQL, so if you want to convert the data, then you would need a, this SQL, you know, file as well. And the last is the, your YAML file containing the pipeline definition. So at very simple, you just define it, name, uh, you know, schedule, start date, and then DDL file and SQL file. And on the basis of the engine you have chosen and uh, what is the, your use case, it might convert into, you know, something like this, right? Where it has various different stages. It will, pre, it will do some pre-checks. It will do, you know, preload the data into a staging thing and it will, it will, you know, finally promote the data uh, to the production and all those things. So, yeah, so I think this is covered here, actually. So these are the major feature uh, of this whole framework because it's, a, you know, it's a very, a, like, efficient, uh, reliable, and, uh, you know, productive. So efficient because it supports, you know, incremental data load. So you don't have to do anything out of the box. Like, you don't have to write anything. Uh, it will just provide you incremental data load. It will automatically create or clean up the old data, like a staging data, you know, it will do it. It will do the, it will run the pretest to make sure the data you are consuming or data you're going to migrate, you know, it's a, like, it's a fresh, it's the latest one. 
it's reliable because it's going to split your task or pipeline into multiple stages so that you know if something got failed in between you can rerun that stage and also it's a very productive because you do not need to know piper python or just say uh, you know you can actually inherit a yaml or you can just copy paste some sql uh, templates to start with with all these i think you know this is the current uses at uber uh, and i'm talking about a single production cluster so we are like happily running 200k pipelines in unpaused state it means like active pipelines and um, i think it can it can go more right we are like in this pipelines like have the task you know from one task to 1000 tasks as well like more than 1000 tasks as well we are doing like roughly 750k you know task runs a day and roughly half a million day runs a day as well we are running a thousand you know salary workers fleet right now and uh, when i say one minute every task scheduling delay it, it means that if a task is supposed to run at say 10 am it would hit the executor and it would mark into running state by 1001 so that is like overall delay from flowing into various stages and uh, you know finally coming into the running state yeah i think uh, last two slides so what's next so there are three actually parallel tracks uh, you know we guys are working on the first thing is like you know doing the uber specific work where we just have to kind of like you know do the disaster recovery and that uh, with the partial failover so what does it mean that partial failover is that you do not want to switch over all the pipelines at once or at the you know at the event of some degradation uh, in the system you may just want to say shift tier 5 pipelines or tier 4 pipelines to the other dc and let uh, you know the tier 1 to tier 2 whatever it is running into the main dc itself hybrid cloud support of course and the safe deployment of pipelines is like is very close to something like versioning of the pipelines where you can uh, you know deploy a new pipeline like deploy a change in the pipeline and that cause an error right so we'll kind of automatically revert to the last known version uh, of that pipeline which was working in the system so something similar to like the the day versioning we can call it out parity with airflow so right now we are working in the introducing async operators into the system and there are plans to migrate to kubernetes executor so uber is already on kubernetes like heavily in kubernetes so our salary workers runs on kubernetes but we do not have a kubernetes executor at the moment or kubernetes pod operator uh, say so i think that is and also lot of other features like cool features like dynamic tasks you know uh, what you call uh, that task flow apis you know data sets concepts those things we are also trying to be in, in parity with airflow and then last is like converging to airflow so we are planning like how we can actually converge to the airflow and given you know that airflow 3 is probably in the talk already lot of things can be i think uh, you know given that airflow 3 has lot of things around the performance and then event driven scheduling uh, and the backfill support you know we can you know potentially converge in some time so we are thinking of like you know starting as parallel service and start migrating pipelines you know in in a you know a smaller fashion so that we'll be able to learn something and then whatever the challenges we face we might have to contribute back to the airflow and then eventually able to you know merge these two things in a one entity right yeah last thing so yeah i think i am a big fan of this marvel multiverse thing right and uh, i see that these are basically piper and airflow are like two version of the same thing but from the different universes and then i like we are trying to make it maybe the the same again right yeah and the last yeah we you guys can reach out me or show with